Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're getting into the next Napoleon video and starting off with the quote here from Alexander. The last sentence was super interesting to me. The spell is broken. A lot of y'all in the comments talked about the, the Russian campaign basically being the beginning of the end, uh, being the start of the fall. Nothing was the same after that. It was sort of the same thing over and over. That's an interesting quote to me. It's in 1812 still. But the thought process from Emperor Alexander is the spell is broken. Everybody, the, the facade has cracked. Everybody has seen what is behind the mask. Um, Napoleon is no longer seen as invincible. Uh, that's really interesting to me. Uh, I'm anxious to get into the video. Let's see what they have to say. Eighteen twelve had been a disastrous year for Napoleon. His invasion of Russia had led to the almost total destruction of an army of half a million men. Now Poland and Germany were wide open to Russian attack. Some advised Emperor Alexander that this was the time to make a favorable peace with Napoleon. Russia's own armies had been mauled, and Western Russia devastated. But Alexander was determined to see Napoleon defeated for good, to free Europe from his clutches, and avenge Moscow's destruction by taking Paris. That's interesting. I wonder what changed his mind so dramatically. Um, one of the things that it talked about in the earlier videos was how well they seemed to get along at first. Um, and even once they each had kind of grievances with the other after their sort of kind of truce, um, I wonder what it was that made him so like, nope, this is it, we're taking him down, this is going to be the end of Napoleon. I wonder if it was Moscow burning specifically, that that was like the unforgivable sin. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious, what do you guys think? Napoleon's allies were deserting him. Prussian troops had already agreed a truce with the Russians. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria, which assumed a policy of watchful neutrality. Napoleon had left Marshal Murat in charge of the remnants of the army, but he left for the Kingdom of Naples, hoping to cut a deal with the Allies that would let him keep his throne. Wow. He was replaced by Napoleon's stepson, Eugène, who'd proved himself a brave and able soldier in Russia, but was unused to independent command, and now faced odds of four to one. As Russian forces advanced through Poland, he continued to retreat west, leaving garrisons to hold strategic fortresses, most of which were soon besieged. On the 7th of February, Russian troops entered Warsaw unopposed. Napoleon's Polish client state, the Duchy of Warsaw, effectively ceased to exist. Three weeks later, Russian troops entered Berlin, while Sweden joined the Allies. You know, you know Napoleon lost his mind when he first heard that Sweden was joining on the side of the Allies. Like, you know he had to have just blown a gasket when he heard that. Sweden was ruled by Napoleon's former Marshal Bernadotte, now officially known as Crown Prince Karl Johan. Many would accuse him of betraying Napoleon, but he'd always been clear that once he became Sweden's Crown Prince, he'd pursue Swedish interests which is what he now claimed to do. Yeah, and everything has changed now. Napoleon just lost a half a million man army. He's on the run. You're seeing parts of Europe that have been established, you know, over, over the Napoleonic Wars just disintegrate in the snap of a finger. If you're Bernadotte and you're on the crown in Sweden, why are you going to jump back on the losing side? Like, even if you had real loyalty to Napoleon, 
this just doesn't seem like a situation where you would, you know, he's back into a corner. I don't think you would want to shift your way into that corner with him. Um, and one of the comments was that the Bernadotte family still sits on the throne of Sweden, which is super interesting because that means that this was a long-term great bet by Bernadotte. Like, he made the bet to join the Allies here, and it meant that his family was going to keep the throne for hundreds of years after. Like, what a great roll of the dice that was. In exchange for Norway, to be taken from France's ally, Denmark, and £1 million from Britain, Bernadotte agreed to join what was now the sixth coalition against France since the Revolution, with an army of 30,000 troops. Ten days later, King Frederick William of Prussia declared war on France. It followed weeks of indecision. The king was widely seen as a weak character and terrified of Napoleon. But with guarantees of Russian military support, the return of lost territory, and enormous financial and material aid from Britain, he agreed to field an army of 80,000 men. On the 17th of March, he issued a proclamation to the people of Prussia and Germany, and mein Volk, to my people, summoning them to fight for Prussia and Germany's honour, in what would soon be known as the German War of Liberation. The Prussian army had been greatly reformed since its humiliating defeat to Napoleon in 1806. A military commission headed by General von Scharnhorst had sacked nearly 200 old generals and abolished flogging, expanded recruitment and introduced exams for officers, and overhauled training, tactics and drill. When Napoleon met the new Prussian army in battle two months later, he remarked, these animals have learned something. Small consolation, they'd learned most of it from him. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, right? Uh, when you fight somebody over and over and over, um, you know, historians make this argument for why the Germanic uh, people were able to eventually overthrow Rome. is because, you know, you gain sophistication um, on the battlefield and you, you kind of see in the enemy what you want to be yourself and it forces you to kind of look yourself in the mirror and make changes. One of the things that it talked about is how the roots of the Prussian system were great, right? The, uh, the old guard basically was still, uh, I guess, alive in myth in, in the, the Prussian ranks. But in reality, the whole thing was falling apart. It was, it was basically only a myth at this point. And so once you get hammered, and it forces you to like, okay, if we're going to survive, we are going to have to make changes here. Then you make those changes and it tactically changes things the, the next time you go up against Napoleon. I mean, that's the point of it, right? You're trying to, you know, maintain survival here. One of the things that a lot of the countries start doing is opening up the military ranks. This whole idea that it's just Napoleon that's going to have this number superiority. Um, you know, after Russia, there are, there are other countries, it's not just Prussia, that widely open up the ranks of their military, start bringing in a lot more people, and the, the armies they are going to field are much larger individually than what some of them were early in the war. This video is sponsored oh. by Curiosity Stream, home of more than two and a half. As his enemies massed in Germany, Napoleon was in Paris, working tirelessly to build a new army with which to face them. 137,000 new conscripts joined the army, and laws passed to call up 100,000 more. 
while 40,000 veterans from the army in Spain, 16,000 marines, and 80,000 men of the National Guard, a home defence force, were transferred to Germany. The new conscripts were nicknamed Marie Louises, after Napoleon's young wife, who passed the new conscription laws in his absence. They were young and raw, two-thirds were teenagers, and there was a severe lack of experienced officers and NCOs. In short, the countless irreplaceable veterans now lying beneath Russian soil. There was also a critical shortage of cavalry. That screams bad news to me. That screams something like the massacre of the innocents in World War I. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to play out in this particular war, but having that many young, raw conscripts in the army gives me like a pit in my stomach. A crisis mocked by British satirists. It would take Napoleon longer to replace the many thousands of horses and trained horsemen who perished in Russia. When Napoleon left Paris for Germany in mid-April, the French situation was precarious. Eugène had been forced back behind the river Elbe to the fortified city of Magdeburg. Dresden, the capital of Saxony, had fallen to the Prussians. The Duchy of Mecklenburg-Schwerin became the first German state to defect from Napoleon's Confederation of the Rhine. Russian Cossacks raided as far as Hamburg, inspiring local revolts against French occupying forces. Meanwhile, Austria stood on the sidelines, so far declining to back either side. Napoleon's miraculous feat of organisation meant he now had more than 200,000 troops in Germany. And the Emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. The morale of his army was high. The Russians, on the other hand, lost their iconic commander, Field Marshal Kutuzov, to pneumonia on the 28th of April. His role was taken over by General Wittgenstein. Russian troops were exhausted and far from home. Their army weakened by the need to contain French garrisons across Poland and Germany. Prussia and Sweden had yet to fully mobilise their strength, and Allied forces barely mustered 100,000 men. They were now heavily outnumbered by Napoleon, and the French Emperor decided to strike quickly. He ordered Marshal Davout to Hamburg, with 35,000 men, to secure his northern flank. He would march against the Russian and Prussian forces converging on Leipzig to force a decisive battle. Victory would make Austria think twice about joining the Allies, allow him to rescue the 90,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, and re-establish his dominance over Europe. As Napoleon advanced on Leipzig, the Allies faced a predicament. To risk battle against Napoleon's larger army, or give up Germany without a fight, a potentially devastating blow to Allied morale and any chance of winning Austria over to their cause. Allied headquarters made the bold decision to attack. They knew most of Napoleon's army was made up of raw conscripts that their own troops were better trained and had a great superiority in cavalry and artillery. That's a big deal. That is what Napoleon has made his name off of. That's what he's been hammering them with over and over and over again is the artillery and the cavalry. I mean, that's how many battles have we seen in this series where the artillery and the cavalry literally win the battle. They make the difference for Napoleon. So that's an interesting like balance there, where Napoleon has more troops, but less cavalry and less guns, and more raw conscripts. 
whereas the the allied side has less troops but better trained more guns and more cavalry like that's an that's an interesting balance going into this the allies agreed that as napoleon crossed the zarla river they would hit his right flank before he could concentrate the full mass of his forces the two armies were on a collision course but napoleon's shortage of cavalry meant he lacked information about Allied movements. On the 1st of May, Marshal Bessières, commanding the cavalry in Murat's absence, was carrying out reconnaissance himself when he was hit by a cannonball and killed instantly. Bessières was the second of Napoleon's marshals to be killed in action, and like Lannes, an old comrade and trusted friend. The Allies were able to surprise Napoleon, falling on Marshal Ney's 3rd Corps near Lutzen. Ney's troops had to cling on in the face of a Russian and Prussian onslaught, while Napoleon rapidly redirected his other corps to fall on the enemy's flanks. At one stage, Napoleon had to personally help rally routing troops as they broke in the face of determined Prussian assaults. But on the whole, his young conscripts fought with courage. And despite hours of savage fighting, Wittgenstein could not exploit his early advantage. As French reinforcements arrived, the battle turned against him. Towards dusk, the Allies were forced to break off the engagement. Though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties, losing just half as many men. General von Scharnhorst, mortally wounded, was among them. Crucially, Napoleon's lack of cavalry meant he was unable to pursue the enemy, who retreated in good order. Expecting the Prussians to fall back on Berlin, Napoleon sent Marshal Ney in pursuit, while he continued east. But the Allied army stayed together, withdrawing to a defensive position at Bautzen, deliberately close to the Austrian border, hoping to entice Schwarzenberg to intervene, and daring Napoleon to violate Austrian neutrality. Night. What an interesting move there. <laughs> what an interesting move to go right up to the Austrian border, take your army there, know that Napoleon's following behind you, and you're like, all right, we are going to do this in like clear sight of Austria. They've got their troops right on the other side of the border. Like, We're going to basically put them in a position where they have to make a decision. That's, that's very interesting to me. Neither happened. Instead, Napoleon ordered Ney to swing south to fall on the Allies' northern flank, while he launched a frontal assault to pin them in place. The battle lasted two days, as French infantry struggled forward against the Prussian and Russian lines. But a misunderstanding over Ney's orders caused a delay that allowed the Allies to narrowly escape Napoleon's trap. Once more, the Allies fought with great determination and inflicted many more losses than they suffered. There were more casualties during the pursuit, including the next day, General Duroc, Grand Marshal of the Palace, responsible for Napoleon's personal arrangements, and his closest surviving friend. Riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree and disemboweled him. His slow, painful death deeply upset Napoleon. The Emperor continued his pursuit to Breslau, once again hindered by his lack of experienced cavalry, while Oudinot was sent north to take Berlin, but was held at Luckau by von Bülow's Prussian Corps. On the 2nd of June, with both sides strained to breaking point, Neutral Austria proposed a ceasefire, which, to the surprise of many, Napoleon accepted. The 
armistice of Plaswitz would last more than two months, a period of intense diplomacy and military mobilisation by both sides. Napoleon wanted time to rebuild his cavalry, a shortage of which had allowed the Allies to escape twice. But he also wanted to keep Austria on side, which he feared might join the Allies with 200,000 troops, even though Emperor Francis I was now his father-in-law, since Napoleon's marriage to his daughter Marie-Louise in 1810. Austrian Foreign Minister Clemens von Metternich, who'd become one of 19th century Europe's most influential statesmen, now took centre stage. Metternich wanted peace, and to see Austria restored as a great European power, which meant Napoleon contained, but not crushed, which would hand too much power to Russia. In June, he travelled to Dresden to ask Napoleon to make concessions, while promising the Allies that if he did not, Austria would join them. But Napoleon dismissed Metternich's terms out of hand. He would not return the Illyrian provinces to Austria, agree to the repartition of Poland, or the breakup of the Confederation of the Rhine. All were out of the question. Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Peace and war lie in your majesty's hands, Metternich is said to have warned him. Today you can still make peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. But Napoleon preferred war to what he called a humiliating peace. On the 12th of August 1813, Austria joined the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. The Allies now had a numerical advantage of 3 to 2, and a new strategy, the Trachenberg Plan. Recognising Napoleon's genius, the Allies would avoid battle with the Emperor, and instead target his marshals, threaten his flanks, and wear down French forces, until it was time to close in for the kill. That's interesting. Uh, the marshals Depending on what part of the war you're talking about, the marshals can get a really good or a really bad rap. Um, I have heard plenty of bad about the marshals, about them pulling down Napoleon. But as you've seen throughout the series, there are times where they they kind of save him. You, you know, like they are well, they're worth their weight in gold in different parts throughout these campaigns. However, they're not Napoleon. You know, like that's not, the comparison isn't to Napoleon. So the thought process is, okay, well, if Napoleon's going to beat our ass everywhere we go, then let's just stop fighting him, right? Like it's, it's not a foregone conclusion. We don't have to keep challenging him. Uh, we can go after everybody else and kind of do here with armies what the Cossacks were doing in Russia, where, you know, Napoleon was having a really hard time protecting all of these different cores that were kind of spread out that were protecting supply lines and communication lines and the Cossacks were really wreaking havoc on those lines um, and so the French had to be very careful about who they sent where and how quickly they moved there and how stretched thin they got this is kind of the same thought process here with just a ton more men over the next few months, the coalition would also receive massive material support from Britain, including eight million pounds in silver and gold coin, 200 cannon with transport, 120,000 firearms, 18 million rounds of ammunition, 23,000 barrels of gunpowder, 30,000 swords and sabres, 150,000 uniforms, 175,000 pairs of boots, 1.5 million pounds of beef, biscuit and flour, and 28,000 gallons of rum and brandy. 
Just on a side note here, it's always been interesting to me that the whole reason that started the American Revolution was the taxation of the colonies because Britain was broke, right? That was their whole thing was like, we have no money. 40 years later, 50 years later, whatever it is, they are literally funding an, an almost like a, a preamble to the world wars, right? Like look at all of the stuff that they're giving to the allied cause here. And they've been bankrolling, you know, Spain and, and they, they've been bankrolling everybody. That's basically their contribution to this war is the blockade and bankrolling. And so that's just very interesting to me that they were like super, super broke 40, 50 years before this. And then now they are literally funding the preamble to the world war. The total value of British aid to the coalition in 1813 was 11.3 million pounds. Damn. Today, worth around half a billion dollars. Napoleon, meanwhile, had turned Dresden into a major supply depot and strengthened his cavalry arm, though it remained a pale shadow of its glorious past. Murat returned to lead it, his secret approach to the Allies having been rebuffed. But when news arrived of King Joseph's disastrous defeat to Wellington's Anglo-Spanish Portuguese army at the Battle of Victoria, Napoleon had to send Marshal Soult, one of his best commanders, to salvage the situation. On the 15th of August, Napoleon left Dresden and advanced against what he considered the most urgent threat the joint Prussian-Russian army of Silesia, commanded by General Gebhard von Blücher, soon to win the nickname Marshal Vorwärts, Marshal Forwards, for his aggressive leadership. But Blücher followed the new plan and retreated when he learned of Napoleon's advance. Napoleon then received news from Marshal Saint-Serre, holding Dresden with 20,000 men that Schwarzenberg's gigantic army of Bohemia was approaching, and the city and its supplies were in danger. Napoleon left Marshal Macdonald to keep an eye on Blücher, and raced back to Dresden, sending Van Damme's first corps to threaten Schwarzenberg's communications. By the time the Allied assault began, enough reinforcements had arrived to fight off the attack. The next day, despite being heavily outnumbered, Napoleon ordered a counter-attack. Struggling through mud and heavy rain, Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's 2nd Corps, broke the Allied left flank and took 13,000 prisoners. The Allies had suffered a disastrous defeat because they'd ignored their own rule. Don't take on Napoleon in battle. But news soon arrived that turned the situation on its head. Marshal Oudinot had resumed his advance on Berlin with 66,000 men. But in three days of heavy combat around Grossbiren, he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North. Some of the most savage fighting was between Napoleon's Saxon allies and von Bülow's Prussians, two German states that for now remained on opposing sides. Three days later, at the Katzbach River, Blücher inflicted a crushing defeat on Marshal Macdonald, driving some French troops into the river itself. Macdonald lost 30,000 men three eagles and a hundred guns, for Blücher's 22,000 casualties. Three days after Napoleon's victory at Dresden, as Van Damme's corps pursued the Allies, it became trapped in wooded valleys around Kulm and was overrun. General Van Damme himself was dragged from his horse by Cossacks, as he and 10,000 of his men were made prisoner. Napoleon sent Ney to take over from Oudinot, who engaged Bülow's Prussian corps at Denewitz. The 
Prussians fighting to save Berlin held their own until Russian and Swedish reinforcements arrived to turn the battle decisively in the Allies' favour. Ney's retreat became a rout, with the loss of another 22,000 men. Napoleon's brilliant victory at Dresden had been completely overturned in just 10 days. The Allied plan was working. Napoleon became increasingly frustrated as Allied armies withdrew wherever he advanced, and advanced wherever he was not. His teenage conscripts were exhausted by constant marching, and famished as Saxony had been stripped bare of supplies. Thousands fell sick, thousands more deserted. Russian and Prussian light troops were now operating behind Napoleon's army, harassing his communications with France. Many of Napoleon's marshals advised him to pull back to the River Rhine. But Napoleon wasn't giving up Germany without a fight. This is all actually super interesting to me because it almost seems like Napoleon is not willing to keep the throne if it isn't in the, like, if it's not the empire that he has built, right? Because he could keep France and even some of the ancillary land around France, but he loses the vast majority of what he's taken over this time period if he goes all the way back uh, and then retreats back to, to the river, right? And so him saying no to that and being like, nope, not going to do it, even though he sees that this is like slowly kind of tightening in around him and that he's having these losses everywhere where he isn't. It's just, it's very interesting that that, that he, you know, he was totally against that. Because, again, he would still have his throne. Like, France would still be his. He would still have land probably, you know, around France that he had taken. But the huge swaths of land and the whole changing of Europe, that would no longer be there. And he just was not willing to make that trade. By October 1813, Napoleon faced a third of a million Allied troops in Germany converging on him from three directions. 900 miles away, Field Marshal Wellington was crossing the Bidassoa River into France, the first enemy army on French soil in nearly 20 years. While the Kingdom of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides and would declare war on France on the 14th of October. Napoleon planned to defend the line of the River Elbe. But the arrival of General Bennigsen's reserve Russian army freed up Blücher, who suddenly marched to join forces with Bernadotte and forced his way across the Elbe at Wartenberg. Napoleon went north with 150,000 men, seeking the decisive battle that would change his fortunes. But once more, Blücher narrowly escaped him. Then came news from Murat, who'd been left with 67,000 men to cover Schwarzenberg. The enemy had bypassed Dresden and was heading for Leipzig. If the city fell, Napoleon would be cut off from France. Once more, he was advised to fall back to the Rhine, but instead, Napoleon ordered all his forces to concentrate at Leipzig. He would risk everything in one great battle to decide the fate of his empire and the fate of Europe. Okay, so that was the Napoleon video, The Road to Leipzig. Again, that's a very interesting decision that he's made not to fall back to the Rhine. He either wants the whole empire 
or, you know, is risking losing the whole thing. Um, I'm curious what you guys think about that. Uh, like, comment, subscribe. I'll release the next Napoleon video tomorrow, and I'll see you guys then.